Well, I'm going to be looking in John chapter 19. That's St. John chapter 19. Not first, second, or third. John chapter 19. And I want to attempt to bring you back just for a moment to the time of the cross. I want you to imagine that you're one of those witnessing Jesus' death on the cross. Or maybe you're one of the Jews that were shouting, crucify him. Maybe you're one of the Romans that were actually crucifying him. Maybe you're one of the disciples that were scared like Peter. Or maybe you're just a passerby -er that really didn't concern you much. And if you were, you may have seen some things on that cross. But there's some things that you couldn't have seen on that cross. The title of my message and what we're going to see here in John chapter 19, Pilate gives us an outline of the things seen on that cross. And then we'll talk about some things that weren't seen. Let's read John chapter 19 and verse 1. And then we're going to skip over. We're going to read 1 through 7. And then we're going to skip up a bit and read some other verses after that. So we'll start with John chapter 19 verse 1, 1 through 7, and then skip to 16. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And, behold, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. For, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. <coughs> when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. We'll skip up to verse 16. <coughs> Verse 16 continues on. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the, of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for sending your Son to die on this cross. And most importantly, we thank you for the resurrection, because without it we are all of all men most miserable. We thank you that you loved us enough to do this. And we love you and we thank you that you love us enough to save us if we'll only believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what would you have seen as you walked by that day? As you were a witness to the cross? What would you have seen? Number one, I say you would have seen a man named Jesus was nailed to the cross. A man named Jesus was nailed to the cross. Look what Pilate says to us here in verse number five. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Jesus was a man. The Bible says a man was nailed to the cross. He was a man that was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. A man with arms and legs that the nails could go through. 
A man with a head that the crown of thorns could be placed upon. A man with a, with a back that had been beaten. A man whose, as Isaiah said, a man whose visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. A man with blood to shed. He had to be a man with blood to shed, for the Bible declares without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. <laughs> when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he declared, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear that we're all sinners in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And with God being a God of justice, He must have a substitutionary atonement. Someone must die. Blood must be shed in order for our sins to be remitted. Isaiah said it like this in 53, 5-6, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He, the Bible says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned away. To his, uh, each one of us have turned away to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There was a man named Jesus nailed to the cross. Well, he was not any ordinary man, though, was he? This man couldn't be any ordinary man. Right. Just as the Old Testament sacrificial lamb was to be without spot or blemish, so must the Lamb of God be without sin. He had to be the Son of God. Look at verse number, five, number 7. Number 7. It says this, Jesus answered him, um, excuse me, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. He made himself the Son of God. So first, if you were a passerby or walking across and seeing, you would have seen Jesus, who declared himself the Son of Man. What you may not have seen as a passerby, but some may have understood, he was also the Son of God. You see, a man named Jesus was nailed to the cross, but God was nailed to the cross also. Colossians 2, 9 says, For him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, He was God manifest in the flesh. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father are one. Now, there are multiple sons of God in the Bible. First, every person by in one aspect or respect is a son of God by creation. Remember, if, if you're here on Sunday night, you remember preaching about Mars Hill and the unknown God. And when Paul was preaching to them, he said, even your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. In him we move and live and have our being. So by that extent, all of us are sons of God by creation. But then there's another set of sons of God. That is, every believer is a, is a son of God by recreation. Now you are adopted into His family, specifically. Now you are a son of God or a daughter of God in the sense because you are now born into His family, John 1.12. But as many as received Him, gave you them power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And then, of course, John 3.16 tells us the same thing, that, that more specifically now, there is only one, the only begotten Son. Jesus, the Son of God, was God in the flesh. The Jews knew He was claiming to be God, John 5.18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because not only had He broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was His Father, making Himself equal with God. One commentator said it like this, Sinful man can't save, and God can't die, so Jesus, who was fully man and fully God, was nailed to the cross. 
In AD 325, the Council of Nicaea strongly affirmed the deity of Jesus Christ, realizing that our salvation depends on the Incarnation. If Jesus Christ was not fully, truly God and truly man, His death couldn't atone or make one for our sins. Make one with God for our sins. Only God would be capable of the infinite sacrifice necessary to the sins of the world. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says it like this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He was the only sinless sacrifice. 1 Peter 1, 19 says, As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, speaking about Jesus. Hebrews 9, 14 says, Through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God. Not only... So if you were a passerby that day, you would have seen a man on that cross. Only if you were a disciple, only if you understood, for some reason, Pilate understood something. It says that Pilate was afraid, all the more afraid when he heard that. Pilate used every excuse he could, or it seems to, to not have to go through with this task. He gave the people every opportunity to back out of it. And then finally he says, fine, you go. You go. I don't see any fault in the man. You might not have known as a passerby that it was the Son of God on the cross. So not only was the Son of Man nailed to the cross, not only was the Son of God nailed to the cross, the Bible also says that our sins were nailed to that cross. Our sins were nailed to that cross. I want you to see what Pilate tells us. Pilate says in verse 5, Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate says, Behold the man. But then he also says, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Our sins are able to be nailed to the cross because he was the sinless, spotless lamb, the only one who could accomplish that. And because he did, 1 Peter 2.24 says this, Who, his own self, bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Amen. He became sin. I've said this before. I tell the young people all the time. The passion of Christ, it describes the, the horrible things that happened to Jesus as, as a man in his flesh. But I say none of that compares to the spiritual agony that he had on the cross that day. Every bit of shame, every bit of guilt, every bit of, of, of remorse that we've ever had, just for one sin sometimes, that's pretty bad, isn't it? But he had them all for every man, from the beginning of creation to the end of the world. He had them all, and God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son. One preacher said this, Jesus died for sin, sins, and sinners. Christ died for individual sin, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So he died for all sins. And unto them that look to him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He died for sinners, Romans 5, 8. But God commanded His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, knowing who would receive Him and who would not. Romans 5, 8, 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, and by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. He died for sin, that it might be sinners, that we might be saved. And He died for sins, that they might be made clean in us. Son of man named Jesus died on the cross, or was nailed to the cross. The Son of God was nailed to the cross. Sin was nailed to the cross. But there's another S there that was nailed to the cross. And that was a sign. There was also a sign nailed to the cross. Look what it says there in verse 19. Thank you, Pilate. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The King of the Jews. 
It's interesting that in all four accounts of the Gospels, this is mentioned. Not always true. But in those four accounts, it's actually mentioned or spoken or written differently. In Mark, it says, the King of the Jews. So some point to this and say, well, here's a discrepancy in Scripture. Here's an error in Scripture. Of course, I believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe that Thy Word is true from the beginning, and every one of Thy righteous judgments endureth forever. I believe there's no scribal errors or issues with the Word of God. Jesus said, One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He declared, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So I don't believe that. For I see this. In Mark, He said, The King of the Jews was written. In Luke 23, 38, it gives just a little bit more detail and says, This is the King of the Jews. And then in Matthew, it says, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And the most descriptive of all came last. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Certainly those four, four books are written from four perspectives. We know that, don't we? I don't know if you noticed it, but it says it was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So whether those four authors were reading the Greek, the Latin, or the Hebrew, maybe, I don't know. But even if not so, one just gave more detail than the other. Sometimes we look for an excuse for the Bible to be wrong so that we don't have to lift it up and be subservient to the words of the living God. We need to trust the words of God. But a couple other things about that sign that was on the cross. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, declared in those three languages. If you were a passerby, you knew one of those three languages, didn't you? In Acts, we find out that the gospel is spread through all the languages. And we are reminded or told that we're supposed to preach the gospel to everybody. Amen. God used an unbeliever named Pilate. He said, don't write, they, the Jews said, don't put on there. He's the king of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. That's his accusation. That's what he did wrong. He said, what I've written, I've written. God used an unbeliever to claim that Jesus was the King of the Jews, which He's also the King of kings and Lord of lords. If we don't do our job, if we're not ready, if we're not found faithful for telling others about Jesus Christ, He's going to use an unbeliever to do it. He's going to do what it takes to get that done. Jesus said this when they told Him not to shout and worship Him. He said, if you don't do it to rocks, the trees will cry out. And I personally don't want to be replaced by rocks or trees. I personally don't want unbelievers to be claiming that Jesus, the King of the Jews, or claiming that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. I want to do what I'm called to do and tell others about that cross. So the Son of Man. If you're walking by, you would have seen a man named Jesus, the Son of Man. If you're walking by, you wouldn't have maybe not have known this unless you're one of the disciples or others. You would have seen the Son of God it was now to the cross. You would, have, you would not have seen this, that sins were nailed to that cross, our sins specifically. And then there's another thing you would not have seen as a passerby. You would have not have seen some scripture was nailed to the cross. Some scripture was nailed to the cross. It says over there in Colossians 2.14, it says this, in Colossians 2.14, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Some scripture, and when I say some scripture, so that I can keep my ass alliteration there, what, I'm ta what it's talking about there is the things that were contrary to us under the law, and he nailed it to the cross. Hebrews chapter 10 helps us out a little bit. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The things of the law were just a shadow of things to come. Verse 16 tells us, For where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of a testator. You see, for a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it's of no strength at all, while the testator liveth. Colossians 
continues on. It goes on to say in chapter 2, the things that were against us were Sabbath days, holy days, high days, many of those things. And it says not to be in judgment of those now. The things in the law that were contrary to us are taken out of the way. The Bible in 1 Corinthians 3 says that the Old Testament is death. The Old Testament is condemnation. The Old Testament, the things of the Old Testament. But it tells us that the New Testament is spirit. It's life because of Jesus. Chapter 9 says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. And 8.13 says, In that he saith, A new covenant hath he made, the first is old, now that which is gaith and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The Jews had a deal that if they obeyed God, He would bless them. They had a deal if they, if they gave their tithe, He would rebuke the devourer. They had a deal that was different than ours. Ours is believe on Jesus, receive Him, and you will be a son adopted into His family. Our deal was now that He promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Our deal, our covenant with Him is a little bit different than the covenant He had with, with Israel. Although it's all based on belief in God and that God would send a Redeemer... Our covenant is new. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written, Cursed is every man that hangeth upon the tree. So Jesus had the sin on him and he also had the curse. That he could redeem us from the curse of the law. Well if you were there that day you would have seen the Son of Man. A man named Jesus down to the cross. You probably wouldn't have seen it unless you knew it. The Son of God, the perfect, spotless Lamb, is nailed to that cross. Amen. Our sins were nailed to that cross. A sign that reminds us that we should proclaim the gospel that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords was nailed to that cross. And also, some scripture. Old covenant. Things that were against us, nailed to the cross. Jesus is now our sacrifice. Let's pray.